Today on Investigate TV Plus, domestic abuse survivors see their safety still in jeopardy. I'm Tisha Powell. And I'm Lee Zurich. Police officers accused of violent crimes and their victims struggle for justice. Plus, there is hope and getting free from domestic violence is absolutely possible. People do it all the time. We'll tell you the resources available to empower survivors to break the cycle. Also, it's a matter of the heart. Across many health conditions, we see that African Americans uh, suffer at greater rates than the white population. We explore the factors that cardiologists say play a major role in heart disease in African Americans and speak to organizations working to eliminate systemic challenges. And inspiring children one breath at a time. The program giving young cancer patients the power to take control over the illness that's controlled their life. In-depth stories that inform and inspire. You're watching Investigate TV Plus. Police officers are issued guns as part of their job, but our team has found even when they're accused of violent crimes like domestic assault, they often get to keep their weapons. Federal law stops those convicted of domestic violence felonies from buying or possessing guns. But investigator Brennan Keefe has found police officers are often not charged, and even those who are often get to keep their guns. My dad's super drunk, and uh, he's trying to rip my head off, and he's getting pretty violent with my mom, and it's not the first time. And pushing me against the wall and putting his hands on my neck. Get out of here! Is he in the room? Yes. These 911 calls have two things in common, ready access to guns. Do you know if the guns are loaded? They all are. He just grabbed one of the guns out of the drawer. And all the callers were families of Georgia police officers. Okay, any weapons in the house? Um, he's a cop, so yes. Are there any weapons in the house? There's plenty. He's a police officer. Domestic violence is a crime in progress. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it can have a very catastrophic end. Steve Searcy carried a gun for 40 years. As a lieutenant with the Montgomery, Alabama Police Department, he created a policy to treat officers like any other domestic violence suspect. Officers had responded to a fellow officer's home on three different occasions and didn't make a report, and they thought they were helping him, and then a few months later, he committed suicide. And if you mix alcohol, firearms, and family violence, you've got a deadly cocktail for a murder. Does he know you're calling? No. He's a police officer for Eaton Hunt. 2020, Amanda Peralt calls 911 in Putnam County, Georgia. It's my husband. He's putting his hands on me. Who is? Oh, my husband. Is he, he there for, now? He is. He works for Eatonton Police Department. What's his name? Michael Seth Peralt. Officer Seth Peralt was arrested for family violence, but was allowed to keep his weapons while awaiting trial. Six days later, Amanda Peralt was shot in the head with one of her husband's guns. Officer Peralt claimed his wife Amanda shot herself. A jury disagreed. Last year, he was convicted of murder. Few police officers arrested for domestic violence end up in court. According to two years of cases we reviewed from Georgia Peace Officer Standards and Training, 87% of officers arrested saw their criminal cases completely dismissed. But Georgia Post found probable cause in 96% of the officers it investigated to suspend or revoke. So how did about half of those officers keep their police certifications? Because Georgia Post uses a special kind of probation. The certification agency faces the same problem prosecutors do. Officers' families don't want to testify. He's pulled out a gun one other time. He said he's he's there is a gun in the home? Yes, ma'am. He's, he's a police officer at Roswell. He's a sergeant, and he's sitting in my mom right now. Roswell Detective Sergeant Chad Harris was arrested for family violence in 2017. He starts to get really violent. This happens every night. To get, every night he's off. It happens every night that he's off. His wife told investigators Harris never hit her, but police photographed red marks on her face and neck. And the incident report said she attributed his aggressiveness to being a police officer. Prosecutors asked the court to take the officer's guns while he was out on bail, but the magistrate ruled to restrict the accused access or proximity to weapons would prevent him working as a law enforcement officer. 
the section restricting dangerous weapons on the standard bond conditions form was crossed out by hand. Do you know if he's got any weapons on him? Not on him, but he hasn't pulled a gun out before. After reviewing that 911 call in the incident report, prosecutors went back to the magistrate, who modified the bond to take his guns. Sergeant Harris resigned from Roswell PD. His wife told prosecutors she wanted the case dismissed, so they dropped all charges except disorderly conduct. He pleaded guilty under Georgia's first offender law, which dismissed the disorderly charges after a probationary period. Cherokee deputies were back at his house in 2021 after his daughter called 911. Uh, okay, what's my dad is drunk and, he, and he's, um, he's attacking my mom and my brother. He called before. Okay. Please don't have sirens on. It'll be so much worse. I'm not a bull****. I want you. The former officer was not charged in that incident. Harris did not return our messages, and he is not currently with any police department, but he remains a post-certified officer. In the last line of defense is the Police Officer Standards and Training Commission. If they determined there was an act of domestic violence, should they be revoking these certifications? In my opinion, yes, because what's going to happen is that officer is going to go to work somewhere else. One out of four officers investigated for domestic violence by Georgia Post kept their jobs. Two were promoted by their agencies. Out of 37 arrests we reviewed, only one officer was convicted on the original charges. The rest can keep their guns under a federal law known as the Lautenberg Amendment. If you've got a conviction, not just an arrest, but a conviction for domestic violence, you can't possess a firearm and you can't be a police officer anywhere in the United States. Because you have to have a gun to be a police officer. Exactly. According to the Giffords Law Center to prevent gun violence, at least two dozen states in Washington, D.C. allow a judge to temporarily ban someone from buying or having a gun if it's considered an emergency. And those states stop someone with a court ordered domestic violence protective order from buying or possessing guns. Domestic violence can happen to anyone. An October 2022 study by the CDC found it's become a serious public health problem that affects millions of Americans. Heather Graff shows you the signs that someone is struggling and where they can go for help. The numbers are staggering. The CDC says 41% of women and 26% of men have experienced either sexual violence, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. If it feels like the way that you're managing your choices are only about making sure that this person is not upset, that's something really to look at. Um, if it feels like you're walking on eggshells. Barbara Gibson is with the Women's Resource Center to end domestic violence just outside of Atlanta. She says some of the signs of domestic violence include the following. Your partner tells you that you don't do anything right. They show extreme jealousy of friends or when you spend time away from them. And that person prevents you from making decisions. It's about power and control. Gibson says domestic violence survivors often suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and miss work because of abuse. And the CDC study echoes this, saying about 75% of female survivors and 48% of male survivors experience some form of injury related to domestic abuse. Getting free from the cycle of domestic violence is possible, but Gibson advises it's different for each survivor. It might take several attempts and it might take involving several people. It might take really extensive planning. But there is hope and getting free from domestic violence is absolutely possible. People do it all the time. Still to come, the new wave of medicine proving to be a powerful weapon against cancer. When I was diagnosed, I had a 10 month old and I didn't think I'd actually see him graduate first grade. The specialized treatment that's changed this dad's outlook on life. But first, African Americans face a higher risk of getting heart disease, the organization's breaking the barriers to better health. You can watch Investigate TV Plus anytime online. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel at Investigate TV. You can catch stories and full episodes. 
Heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, and the statistics are even more troubling for African Americans. A 2019 study by the Department of Health and Human Services found black people are 30% more likely to die from heart disease than whites. The Cleveland Clinic says social factors play the biggest role in shaping health, including access to money, quality education, access to clean air and water, and nutritious food. We take a closer look at the impact that heart disease has on black communities and the efforts to fight it. When it comes to heart disease, African Americans are disproportionately more susceptible. A February 2023 report by the Department of Health and Human Services shows black people are 50% more likely to have a stroke as compared to their white counterparts. They're also likely to be younger. And so for an African American to have a stroke at, at the unfortunate age of 51 is really not that uncommon in the black population. Dr. George Howard at the University of Alabama at Birmingham has conducted research on why African Americans have strokes at young ages. He says it's not because they're unaware of the disease, but it has a lot to do with managing it. Take, for instance, the amount of salt in food. It appears as if blacks are, are disproportionately sensitive to the salt. And so even given the same amount of salt, their, their blood pressure levels might rise more rapidly. Historic and systemic factors play a major role in this salt sensitivity. Research done at Mount Sinai in New York suggests African Americans may carry a gene that makes them more salt sensitive, increasing their risk for high blood pressure and heart disease. Black women also tend to have higher rates of obesity and diabetes, which puts them at greater risk for high blood pressure and heart disease. Another hurdle is access to healthy food. And in particular, something called the Southern diet. There's a lot of fried food, collards, uh, organ meats, sweet tea. According to a February 2023 survey by the Cleveland Clinic, poverty might prevent someone from following a heart healthy diet, especially if the person lives in a food desert. Food deserts are defined as low income communities with limited access to healthy food. The Cleveland Clinic found about 20% of black Americans say it's hard for them to access stores that sell healthy food compared to 15% of white Americans. Across many health conditions, we see that African Americans uh, suffer at greater rates than the white population. Lauren Ming is with The Links Incorporated, a nonprofit service organization focusing on friendship and service for the community. Ming says socioeconomic disparities can limit some African Americans' access to health care. A 2022 report by the American Heart Association says lack of access to medication and distrust of healthcare professionals based on historical discrimination are contributing factors to an aversion to blood pressure medications. Vanderbilt University cardiology professor Dr. Andre Churchwell echoes this sentiment. Personal attitudes, policies, practices, whether it means uh, institutional practices or policies, whether it means federal government or local government practices or policies over a period of time that have led to differences in health care or differences in, uh, that, that have led to racial inequities for people of brown and black skin. We're more obese, African Americans are more obese than our white counterparts, which have uh, unfortunate negative downstream health effects such as type 2 diabetes. Dr. Churchwell says heart health for African Americans boils down to resources and availability, including early treatment, early prevention, and preventative measures. Lauren Ming says her organization is working to bridge the gap. Your health is your wealth, and so taking care of your health is above most importance. The health experts we spoke to say anyone in a lower income household will eat worse because healthy food can be expensive. One solution can be found in the frozen food aisle since frozen veggies and fruit don't spoil as quickly. They also recommend getting your blood pressure checked each year, knowing your family history, controlling stress, reducing alcohol intake, exercising and not smoking. Coming up, inspiring healing. I was very confused. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. Teaching children to overcome their illness one breath at a time. 
But first, a dad diagnosed with stage four cancer feared he wouldn't live to see his infant son grow up. I'm pleased to say that I actually watched him get his driver's license uh, last month. The treatment that's credited for his survival and offering hope for a potential cure. Our in-depth coverage continues. You can get connected to Investigate TV Plus on all social media platforms. The word nuclear is often associated with energy, but the FDA says nuclear medicine is one of the fastest emerging technologies in healthcare. Yeah, according to the FDA, nuclear medicine can be used in targeted treatments to kill or damage cancer cells, reduce the size of tumors, or reduce pain. Reporter Brendan Cullerton shows us why leading physicians hope nuclear medicine could eventually lead to a cure for cancer. Josh Mailman travels to Washington, D.C. twice a year to advocate for cancer patients, but his world seemed much more limited when he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer 16 years ago. When I was diagnosed, I had a 10-month-old, and I didn't think I'd actually see him graduate first grade. Despite living with stage four cancer for 16 years, Mailman now travels the country, competes in races, and coaches his son's high school sports teams. You know, I'm pleased to say that I actually watched him get his driver's license uh, last month. Mailman points out he has also kept his hair. Mount Sinai Chief of Nuclear Medicine Munir Ghassani says what allows patients like Josh to suffer less side effects than many receiving other treatments is the fact that nuclear procedures can target cancer cells specifically without harming healthy cells. Deliver your treatment at a highest possible concentration to where it matters and avoid going to the non-target areas. Mailman was forced to receive his procedure in Germany more than a decade ago, but since then, the Food and Drug Administration approved more types of nuclear treatments for U.S. use. FDA Director of Radiation Medicine, Louis Marzella, says radioactive treatments are safer than many assume. They are given in very low doses. We don't expect or really tolerate any serious reactions for diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals. Marzella believes nuclear treatments will continue making significant progress and sees potential to eventually treat Alzheimer's and dementia. So it's an expanding area that uh, offers you know, great hope. Mailman says there needs to be more awareness about the nuclear treatments already available. The quality of life that one has using nuclear medicine treatment is, is really incredibly high. According to the Mayo Clinic, nuclear medicine treatments are given in an outpatient setting. The patient is usually on site for up to eight hours each time. Side effects can occur and they depend on the therapy. It used to be common for people to experience nausea, but that's become far less of an issue. And some notice hair loss, but it's usually only a little, and hair grows back. Up next, from victim to victor. For some of them, it's it, they, their eyes light up and they get really excited and others are going, okay, what's this all about? The program inspiring seriously ill children to overcome pain with power, peace, and purpose. A rabbi with a black belt in karate is using martial arts to help kids fight cancer. Rabbi Ili Melek Goldberg, also known as Rabbi G, founded Kids Kicking Cancer back in 1999 after the death of his own child from cancer. Since then, he's traveled the globe helping thousands of seriously ill children use meditation and breathing exercises to conquer fear, pain, and stress. We go to Savannah for a first-hand look at how his program works. I think um, anytime we can be the first with something, particularly in a program like this, is very exciting. Come in. We come in uh, to be able to help some of the young people that are in the hospital that are experiencing pain, discomfort, and either recuperating or getting ready to go in for some type of treatment. Have you ever seen martial arts before? For some of them, it's it, they, their eyes light up and they get really excited and others are going, okay, what's this all about? Kobe, are you ready for this? I was very confused. I had no idea what was going on. Well, the starting point is always to be able to teach them the breathing techniques, which are very interesting, is where we're going to be breathing in the light 
and then there's certain things that we do and then breathing out the darkness and some of that what that alone will do it'll help to change some of the way your your brain is working and so you're able to kind of trick it into realizing that you have control of the pain and empowering the child or the young person to be able to have control over something that's controlled their life really will help them to be able to move forward in their treatment. The key is the three words that the children use. Power, peace, purpose. That no matter what we face in our lives, we can bring in this extraordinary light, this energy, and push out pain, fear, and anger. Well, it definitely gives me like a peace of mind and um, about things that are in the future. Well, that was relaxing. Um, it really gets the kids up and moving and gets them interactive and really ends up being um, a healing modality to really um, accentuate getting them um, out of the hospital and home. And <laughs> these are things that they're going to be able to continue to use while they're at home um, and continuing on out in the community. You breathe in all of the light. And that's the secret source of the hero circle. Every child becomes a teacher not despite their challenges, but sometimes because of their challenges. When they learn that they have the ability to breathe in this light and to push out the darkness, they can inspire the planet. Very good, Sophia. So I get strength and inspiration. And I have been privileged to learn so much wisdom from these beautiful children. Power, peace, purpose. Now those are tips, mindfulness tips, that I could use every day, breathing in the light, pushing out the darkness. That's beneficial for all of us, I think. And those kids now bringing it back out and mm -hmm. getting to teach it, as they said, to others as well, yeah. too. Very nice. All right, that's it for us here on Investigate TV Plus. I'm Lee Zurich. And I'm T. Chappelle. Thanks for watching. On the next Investigate TV Plus. A lot of folks think it's not going to happen to them. An unexpected trip to the hospital can leave a person with crushing financial debt, the tools you can use to navigate this complicated system.